Welcome to Translating Illness, the live webinar series associated with the Translating Illness Research Project. My name is Marta Arnaldi and I am a LAMI Research Fellow at the Queen's College University of Oxford and the convener of this series. Translating Illness brings together researchers from across different disciplines, as well as clinicians, performers and artists. Everyone is very welcome to this series. Together, we will explore and experiment with the many meanings of translation in the sciences and humanities in the hope of finding ways to improve health and well-being through interdisciplinary knowledge. This live event will run until June. Please visit the translatingillness.com website to state the dates. These meetings would not be possible without the ongoing support to so many people, including mentors, students, speakers, and participants. So thank you all. And a very special thank you goes to Kira Alman, without whom we could not be meeting tonight. Kira is a postdoctoral research fellow in media law and policy, and she's also a graphic designer, artist, and audio video producer, who is providing web and tech support for this project. And now I'll introduce our three excellent speakers. It is an immense honor for me to welcome Claudia Durastanti, the award-winning author of four novels, a co-founder of the Festival of Italian Literature in London and an accomplished translator. Claudia won the Mondello Giovanni Prize and was shortlisted for the Strega Prize and the Viareggio Prize. Claudia was born in Brooklyn, studied in Italy at La Sapienza and in the UK at the Montfort University in Leicester and currently lives between London and Rome. Our second guest is Elizabeth Harris, a literary translator from the US specializing in Italian fiction, including Tabuki and as we will see, Durastanti. Just like Claudia, Liz is the recipient of numerous prizes for her outstanding translations. In 2018, Liz was awarded a Liter Literature Translation Fellowship from the National Endowment for the Arts. The first speaker is Dr. Emma Bond, reader in Italian and Comparative Literature at the University of St. Andrews. Emma had the crucial role in designing today's event, which she supported and inspired with her kindness and expertise. Emma is a fine critic, and amongst her publications, which include two monographs and four co-edit volumes, I would just mention two brilliant books, Disrupted Narratives, Illness, Silence and Identity in Svevo, Pressburger and Morandini, and Destination Italy, representing migration in contemporary media and narrative, which Emma prepared with Guido Bonsavé and Federico Falofa. So we are gathered today to discuss through literature the intimate yet largely uncharted link between translation and deafness. And we will do so by reflecting upon three exceptional books. Two of these books already exist, whereas the third one is yet to be published. So book one, which you can see on the slide, is Claudia's Italian translation of Ocean Wong's beautiful novel, On Earth the Briefly Gorgeous, published by La Nave di Teseo in 2020. Book two is La Straniera, imprecisely translatable as The Foreigner, which is Claudia's latest breathtaking novel, also published by La Nave di Teseo in 2019. Book three is currently being created by Liz, who is translating Claudia's novel into English. The translation is forthcoming with Fitzcarraldo editions in spring 2022. We will therefore have the precious opportunity of listening to some of the passages prior to publication, which is a rare privilege. In the novel La Straniera, the two main themes of deafness and migration are brought together by continuous attention towards language, communication and translation. The deaf zone, as we will try to explore, is a translation zone, that is the space where the word foreign may acquire new unprecedented meanings. Claudia, since I've just mentioned it, could you introduce us to the different meanings of the Italian title La Straniera? In what ways, if any, do you think that the title has to do with or reveal something about disability and translation?
with this book uh, also meant in some cases that I had a better cultural understanding of deafness compared to my mother who was living deafness. So definitely this was an equation, I wouldn't say equation, but I wanted to challenge the ambivalence of both the experience of deafness and migration. Thank you very much, uh, Claudia. I will just add a quick note, very brief. Uh, I'm translating a book by Charles Yu, uh, who won the National Book Award, and it's called Interior Chinatown. And apparently it has nothing to do with this, but today I was translating a passage where a white character is speaking to the Asian uh, character who self labels him an un unidentified Asian man. And when they speak to a foreigner, they would use this kind of a louder voice and also act as if it's sign language. You often do that with people that come from others. So the, the you know, using sign mockery, sign language to make yourself understood with a foreigner is something that we witness on an everyday basis. Yeah, this is a beautiful remark. Thank you, Claudia. And while you were saying it, I was just thinking about uh, the ways in which uh, the experience of foreignness and otherness, in a sense, implies a deeper embodiment of language. So our body speaks uh, as a whole, uh, and words become part of it, of it and vice versa. So I think it's a beautiful remark. Thank you, Claudia, and also for your response. And uh, I, would like, I would like now to ask Elise, um, in what way uh, she's uh, uh, working on this title, given uh, these uh, plurality of meanings that uh, Claudia explained to us? Well, <laughs> um, I would say that, um, that you know, Claudia's English is so spectacular. So from the very beginning, Claudia and I have, <clears throat> have both discussed this and also um, with, the book is also being published at Riverhead in, um, in New York, so uh, also with um, with the editor there, we've reflected on it um, with these ideas in mind. Also, though, with um, with something that's pretty important to the book as well, which is the relationship to Camus um, and the English uh, title that is generally um, the stranger. Um, so how how to you know how to hold on to that, but also have um, have had the female component, which as, as Claudia said, is, you know, is so important. Um, and um, I'm going to say, I don't like to admit this because I'm, I'm passionately defensive of my language. I love Italian. I chose Italian to learn it, but I, I adore English. Um, and normally I uh, feel that, that English can do everything that any other language can do by God. But in this situation I, I think I think English is, is has has a disability quite frankly it's limited um, in that we can't get at the female um, quality of la straniera in English and it's very frustrating um, but something that, that, that Claudia suggested which uh, I don't know if this is we don't have a title yet in other words but what what she suggested was um, uh, possibly the strange her which uh, you know, with a with a hyphen in between, my my partner and I uh, obsess over this, and my partner suggested that possibly it should be the stranger with a little H in parentheses between G and E to give. Uh, we actually suggested that uh, when I I have submitted the the manuscript and it's now being edited, um, but apparently that won't work. We can't have that. Also, I thought maybe in captions, you know, in brackets. So it cap, uh, I thought that would be perfect for this, for this book. But we can't have that because you can't look it up. You can't Google it, you know, with those, with those marks. Um, so uh, I don't know exactly what will happen with the title, but, but both of us feel that it, it should stay as um, some, some relationship to the stranger. Um, the editor at Riverhead has proposed keeping the Italian title just keep it, but I, I, don't, I don't know about that. That feels like that's just won't have the same kind of draw. Um, I had proposed early on, given what happens with the mother who wanders around outside perpetually um, disappearing um, and also given the British title of the outsider that possibly the title could be the outside woman as well. But um, I think we've, we've both agreed that it should be some uh, 
some distortion of of the title the stranger so we'll see we'll see what happens thank you Liz. sure i really like this title especially i like the stranger I, i'd be curious to hear what uh, the audience will think later um so uh, throughout the novel we move across uh, all sorts of languages basically um written words, sign languages, subtitles, sound captions, metaphors and WhatsApp messaging, music and silence, mother tongues and foreign tongues, and everything that lies in between. So by keeping in mind that these are uh, prismatic, pris prism of uh, meanings or prismatic, uh, really, uh, uh, significance of, of language and its importance in the novel. I would like uh, um, you to expand a little bit, uh, if you can, on uh, something that you mentioned before, uh, that is uh, the uh, possibility uh, of considering sign languages used by uh, the deaf communities across the world as foreign languages and, by extension, deaf cultures as, as foreign cultures. Yes, so first I must say that when I moved to Italy as a little girl, uh, we had a sort of family rule, me and my brother, that we had to move away from the strangeness of the way my parents spoke, of the broken language of my grandparents who spoke dialect and they never really fully learned Italian or, or English. So we had a sort of rule that we had to speak at the best and write at the best of our abilities. So we opted for this very standard formal Italian that was clean, pristine, and didn't have no nuances of dialect. So it would hit, you know, good marks in school, but maybe would make you less able in social context when you're hanging out with friends, because uh, the more you have uh, an understanding of nuances or level of language, the more you are able, if we are speaking about disability in a way, uh, and in a way, I think, my mother perpetually chose uh, by refusing to use sign language with hearing people or uh, sticking to her uh, weird, I would say, uh, multifaceted language, not to um, abide by this correctness. Uh, and she would be very uh, um, unpolite even <laughs> in the use of language. So I wanted to move away from that the further I can. I became a writer, I became a translator, and somehow I truly believed on the surface that my style and the way I wrote and the way I worked had to stick to this idea that the more I was clean, the more I would be understood. And this was a huge loss, I must say. And uh, I had people that were encouraging this loss, not only editors, but also people constantly asking me, do you feel more attached to the Italian or English in you? But I had this whole alien and foreign and uh, uncovered language. I call my family, I say that we used to speak in the black market of language. And so that's when I did this kind of operation of a recovering. And I realized that my style was highly influenced by my mother's syntax. And I still, that, that still holds true. Uh, and so when I would make mistakes, mistakes to me is essential in the idea of translation and the way I work. Um, I also think translation can be the history, as I say in the book, of poetic inaccuracies uh, in a way. And what I like about, even though I never learned the same language, uh, but I do uh, feel that, that I, we can consider a foreign language to the extent that when we read about foreign words in a text, when we relate to foreign languages, we are forced to think about the non-standardness, so the arbitrariety of language. And so in a way, sign language makes very transparent on the surface through body what it pertains to all languages in a way that their constantly words are constantly open to <laughs> being transformed and they're not fixed. There's a convention, they're fixed as we speak, but the writer, the more you're creative, uh, the more you try to challenge this being you know, fixed uh, of words. So that what was useful for me. So even though I'd never learned sign language in a way, I, approaching it as I do in the book, and maybe I'll read a, a bit of, about this later on, was the fact that it showed, it brought language up onto the surface uh, compared to what I was doing that was trying to hide in a way. 
So that was for me what was relevant. And I wouldn't say I took pride, but I thought I think that this broken language had a beautiful impact on me, even if it was unconscious, because it made me more risky now. Uh, the more I acknowledge the kind of broken language I come from, the more I take risks in writing. Whereas when I had this monolinguistic idea, uh, it was a loss, I would say. And also, I think this, I would conclude, um, I realized today how profound some definitions in your own language can affect the way you think. So for example, in Italian, uh, the word minority is minoranza, but you would have some time in a derogative way when you had to describe someone who was disabled, you would say minorato. And so it has the same roots. In a way, it was this equation between being in a minority and my mother and I belong to different kinds of minorities where there was gender minority, class minority, uh, disability, and so on. And that you belonging to a minority, you are automatically uh, had some kind of impairment or deficiency. And so what I wanted to do with this book was challenge this and challenge this starting from language. So my idea was to recover all those hidden languages in me that I had labeled as impaired languages. And, for, and so sign language is one of those. Thank you, Claudia, for, uh, for this uh, beautiful and rich uh, response. Uh, uh, there are so many threads we could follow here, but I just would like to pick on, on one. When you talked about uh, um, the ways uh, uh, in which uh, translation uh, enables uh, the transformation uh, of words, uh, and the passages of status, you know, from, il from illness to healing even, uh, and so on and so forth. So actually I would like to, re to reflect uh, on uh, uh, the uh, bodily dimension of uh, translation, uh, as well as on the mental and imaginative dimension that we are most used to. Uh, and uh, I found these beautiful uh, uh, sentences that I shared with you, uh, written by George Steiner, when he said that great translation moves by, by touch. And that the translators, he was actually talking more, more specifically about poets, but also about translators, can even smell words. So all this like attachment and closeness of translation to the senses. So I would like to ask you whether you would like uh, to share with us uh, your reflection on uh, this link, on a possible link between translation and disability. And I would like to ask you if you think that translation can, in a sense, help us better understand disability. Yes, I'm very, uh, I became, uh, as I learned uh, more and more about deafness disability, and I started to think, to be reflective of my own practice. Uh, the first, it, why did I end up being a translator? I, I was an interpreter in between words since a very young age. So uh, I think that what's informed my, my practice, but at one point I would pick up and books in Italian that translated um, disabilities or that would discuss uh, disability and focus on how it was possible that you still had today words that even if not openly offensive or derogative felt that they came from the past in a way. So they were time traveling in a sort of weird way. So I remember reading Ritorno uh, Reims by the, the Didier Ribon, French writer. So he was speaking about um, handicap and the translator wrote handicapato. This was happening in 2019. And handicapato is a very derogative, it's handicapped. It, this word is completely disappearing from the scenario of uh, mutual interactions and it was, uh, pretty odd. I'm not here speaking about what we should do or we should not do, but of course I think translation somehow can emphasize this. If a writer natively used handicapped in a way it would feel less distorted compared to have founding in a translation because you're supposed in your practice to really focus on word. It's less, it's more mediated in a way. So this is why I think the simple act of pondering words or considering the alternatives in a way. You have, when you write, I, I speak in here as a writer and as a translator, uh, I'm not saying that you don't think about words, but there's also, there is a component of instinct in a way that it feels that the first choice you make is the best choice. 
translation in a way is the opposite because you're constantly exposing yourself to a variety of options. So when we translate this ability in a way, what I think it's important in the practice of translation is the fact that you're constantly open to alternatives of definitions. And so since the debate is pretty much on how we see this conflict on labeling yourself, labeling other people or affirmating yourself or uh, helping out opening like roads for people to choose uh, how they want to express uh, themselves about themselves. How can you help actually? That, that's something that uh, I really think uh, it is interesting. And when it comes to the body uh, side of it, of the quote you were mentioning, I thought it was so funny that I spent so many years in college reading about, you know, French theory that they would, how language, um, embodied language there were constantly metaphors about the body and language and then when i went into the deaf zone in a concert in the states and i saw sign interpreters that were translating music uh through their body i thought how is this uh how can it be an influence for my own work in writing and translation and what happened is that it brought in senses that i had excluded uh, my writing and my translation were less synesthetical before and now through thinking about deafness and the practice of translation and sign language, I think uh, it I added some texture or layers. And so I think right now that both my writing and translating are more synesthetical than they used to be because I, I constantly focus on what's missing. That is so beautiful, thanks. Um... Thank you, uh, Claudia. And since you mentioned, it, we are all very curious to hear, uh, um, uh, like uh, you reading your own uh, uh, work, since you mentioned your own writing and translating experience. And uh, if you would like to read for us the passages you've chosen, which will be followed by Elise's uh, translation immediately after. Thanks. Do you um, do you want to read? You'll read the first section and then I'll read the the translation and then you'll read again Claudia is that how you want to do it uh I was thinking that it's two pages how do you feel I would do like read in one chunk and then you do it that's fine whatever you whatever yeah. you'd like so this is a passage specifically on uh deafness metaphors and translation ho sempre pensato che la sordità fosse un ostacolo per il loro pieno apprezzamento del linguaggio figurativo. Da bambina, credevo pacatamente che ci fosse una lacuna cognitiva nei miei genitori che avrei fatto del mio meglio per colmare, barattando e interpretando le parole per loro. Ma stando ad alcuni studi, non ci sono differenze di comprensione significative tra adolescenti sordi e adolescenti udenti quando si imbattono in una metafora e in un romanzo. L'ironia è leggermente diversa. Pare che gli adolescenti sordi diventino sempre più capaci di capirla quando crescono, quando diventano consapevoli di un tono che inflette, infetta le persone attorno a loro. Ma l'ironia è una figura che arriva con una perdita di innocenza per tutti, che sentano o meno. La prima volta che mia madre ha capito una battuta ironica aveva 55 anni e io e mio fratello l'abbiamo fissata a lungo, stupefatti. È stata un'emozione nuova, piena di gratitudine. Il cammino dentro una metafora può essere più lento, tortuoso e imprevedibile per un lettore sordo, ma questo è vero per tante persone. Anche se ci affidiamo a un archivio condiviso di simboli, quando leggiamo un'opera d'arte, le nostre traduzioni interiori di quei simboli variano. Davanti ai test che, fanno, che si fanno per misurare le competenze testuali di una persona, Penso anche io che ci sia un errore se un bambino sordo si perde tutto il simbolismo nel meraviglioso mango di Oz, ma quell'errore mi manca. Se una metafora è un incidente, una rivelazione, un incidente stradale, io finisco con il raccattare sempre gli stessi pezzi di vetro andati in frantumi. Non conquisto o guadagno mai un nuovo frammento, mi limito a partecipare al costante riciclo della bellezza. Non so se i miei genitori fossero fieri di disubbidire alla grammatica, se fossero solo troppo pigri per sviluppare buone doti di alfabetizzazione, o se semplicemente si fidassero troppo dei loro sensi e preferissero demistificare un codice al quale non appartenevano comunque. Ma penso spesso a loro quando traduco romanzi da una lingua all'altra, 
non sono più spaventata dalla mia tentazione o inclinazione verso gli errori. Un po' di tempo fa mi sono ritrovata a pensare alla Neverland di James Barry in Peter Pan. In italiano Neverland è stato tradotto con l'isola che non c'è, ma a dire il vero una traduzione letterale dell'inglese sarebbe stata meglio. Mentre l'isola che non c'è alluda a un territorio che è impossibile trovare e forse non esiste, il letterale mai terra contiene un rifiuto, un desiderio di tagliare qualsiasi legame con il mondo tradizionale ed è più vicino alle intenzioni dei bambini perduti di Peter Pan. Anzi, per farlo risuonare come il grido di battaglia di un bambino, terra mai funziona ancora meglio. Terra mai è la traduzione letterale di Land Never, qualcosa che James Perry non ha mai usato e sembra cattivo inglese, qualcosa che non è mai stato lì in primo luogo, ma ai miei genitori sarebbe piaciuto. Credo che questo errore sia più fedele a quello che direbbe un bambino, sia capace di restituire un senso gioioso di fuga e riscrivendo la storia nella mia testa con una nuova parola, imito i loro atti quotidiani di sfida linguistica. La traduzione è anche la storia di una poetica inaccuratezza. In questo gioco i miei genitori mi battono sempre. I've always thought deafness was an obstacle to their fully recognizing figurative language. As a girl without reflecting on it, I believed a gap existed in my parents' knowledge and that I could work my hardest to fill this gap by interpreting and swapping out words for them. According to some studies though, there are no real differences between deaf and hearing teenagers when it comes to understanding a metaphor they might find in a novel. Irony is a bit different Apparently, deaf teenagers understand irony more as they develop, as they grow increasingly aware of a tone that inflects, infects the people around them. But irony is a figure of speech that arrives with a loss of innocence for all, hearing or otherwise. The first time my mother understood an ironic joke, she was 55, and my brother and I just stared at her, amazed and incredibly grateful. For a deaf reader, the journey inside a metaphor can be slower, more winding and unpredictable, but this is true for many of us. While we rely on a shared archive of symbols when we read a work of art, our internal translations of those symbols vary. When it comes to tests for measuring reading comprehension, I do think it's a mistake if a deaf child misses all the symbolism in The Wonderful Wizard of Oz, but I miss that kind of mistake. If a metaphor is an accident, a revelation, a car accident, I'm always left picking up the same shattered bits of glass. I never capture, never obtain a new splinter. I just stick to my part in the constant recycling of beauty. I don't know if my parents were proud of not following the rules to proper grammar or were just too lazy to develop their skills in literacy or simply put too much trust in their senses and preferred demystifying a code that didn't pertain to them anyway. But I often think of them when I'm translating novels from one language to another. I'm no longer worried that I'm drawn to errors, that I have a soft spot for them. Not too long ago, I found myself thinking about James N. Barry's Neverland in Peter Pan. In Italian, Neverland has been translated as l'isola che non c'è, the island that's not there. But honestly, a literal translation of the English would be better. While l'isola che non c'è suggests a territory that's impossible to find or even non-existent, the literal my terra is a refusal the longing to cut all ties to the traditional world and is closer to the lost boy's intentions. No, as a children's resounding battle cry, Terra Mai works even better. Terra Mai is the literal translation of land never, something James N. Barry never used, which is just bad English, not something that was ever there to begin with, but my parents would like it. I think this error is more faithful to what a child would say. It restores a joyous sense of escape. And as I rewrite the story in my head to include this word, I'm imitating my parents' daily acts of linguistic defiance. Translation is also a story of poetic imprecision. In this game, my parents always win. Thank you so much, both of you, for 
sharing this beauty. <laughs> and uh, um, I don't know whether, uh, Liz, would you like uh, to comment uh, on uh, this translation? Any challenges? Well, any? Sure. Um, let me let me just say that um, that in in um, in translating this, um, what I've done is what I do actually with with all of the books that I translate is that I I trust the the writers, you know, great abilities and what they're doing with their prose. And with Claudia, I had the the added um, gift that she what she told me is that um, is that she is in some ways estranged from Italian because of her, of her uh, you know, American English language as her blueprint language, as she's told me, and also because of her, because of her background. Um, and that the English translation should also in some ways uh, reflect this, this somewhat broken quality that's there in the in the Italian and I had I had mentioned in our exchanges and emails and perhaps this is a time to say it that um, that the um, the distortions of syntax was that was something that Claudia pointed out to me and it's actually it's there in the novel it's 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 a line in the novel of it's something that she holds on to from her mother it's one of the last things possible the last thing that she holds on to in language you know of her mother um, so in translating um, her book, I I just I trusted what what I saw and um, and what I heard um, and felt right and sensed um, and those especially those passages that um, that incorporated a sort of a twist in syntax um, I held on to um, and I'm gonna if you don't mind I'm just gonna read one very quickly that's there in in the English I won't read the Italian but I'm sure that any you know a, a native English speaker will hear it um, this is the end of the paragraph and then I'm gonna read the twisted sentence that holds on to what's there in the Italian so here's the end of a paragraph sometimes when she took the bus and the driver asked if she was from Peru or Romania she'd nod and provide no other explanation almost flattered by this mistake and this is the sentence. Along with her hearing, my mother lost other things at boarding school, a friend in the water, which is, I believe, following almost exactly what's what's there in the Italian. And, and I can say now, because two editors have, have looked at it, that it's been corrected two times by editors and, and normalized, you know, put into more standard English. And each time, um, each time I've insisted, no, 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 that this is like very much a, a part of the fabric of, of the novel. And, um, and any writer, I think, who really knows how to write um, pushes on style. And that's something for the translator to recognize and to push into the English. But Claudia, as she said, it, it's really, you know, her experiences um, with, her, with her parents, with, um, with the deaf community has, has pushed her style, you know, that much further, and and so it's been my job to to make sure that the English of her of this novel is not normal. You know, I hope that it's beautiful, but it has to be. Um, and when I say normal, I mean in quotes normal. That it has to be um, pushed into something something new um, that that you know is related to to the idea of difference of estrangement. That's all I'll say. <laughs> Thank you, Elizabeth. I sure. think I will now uh, lend the uh, uh, pass on to Emma. Emma, would you like to take, uh, <laughs> to, con to, to, to go on with your uh, questions? Thank you, Martha. Can you hear me OK? <laughs> okay. Um, Claudia and, and Liz, to both of you, really, I'm, I'm very interested in this idea of acts of, of linguistic defiance that we've been talking about. And I think you've both spoken really powerfully to how that functions in the novel in, in relating these kind of experiences um, of speaking and translating across languages. Um, but I was, I was quite struck by what both of you have said at different points. Claudia, you mentioned that you've had kind of battles with editors, um, perhaps trying to correct uh, 
risks or, or mistakes that you you want in your writing, right? And, and Liz, there's this, this ongoing discussion around the title, and, and perhaps you want it to make it a bit more edgy, a bit more creative than uh, the publishers are happy with. Could you both speak to the to the spaces that there are within your own publishing experiences for this kind of risk taking, for for these kind of linguistic acts of defiance to take space? Yes. I would uh, say that one of the underlying themes in the book, before I mentioned this idea of ability, and I was thought that uh, I would be, in quotes, <laughs> the idea of being able uh, as long as I conformed to standard language. And it, to me, it was very interesting that I always uh, believed somehow that while I was using prose and verse, that I was, you know, working on my fiction, that it would be unbound territory where, the, where I could um, explore. But then I realized that even Italian fiction compared to, I wouldn't say that it's inherently more experimental than English fiction, but certainly it is more closer ties with poetry as more lyrical traditionally. But then I realized when I started publishing that there was a certain barrier in a way, there was a certain extent to which you could go and it still had to be in the realm of, I wouldn't say being understandable, but I would introduce also this idea of pleasure. Uh, and I don't believe personally, aesthetically, that uh, you cannot enjoy a text uh, if you don't are always helped out or if there's a, always a pleasant experience, which is increasingly what I experience not only in my writing, but especially in the translations that I submit. So I'm very vocal about this because, uh, and I'm worried about, maybe Liz would speak about this because I'm translating from English into Italian. Uh, and so there's this idea um, that translating from a major language to, into a minor language, that you're not allowed, uh, I wouldn't say to edit or to pervert the original text, but you're not even allowed to make um, creative errors, let's say. You're not allowed to explore um, this hidden, uh, I mean, if the translation is not a relationship between A and B, but there's always, you know, something that was even hidden for the author. And so sometimes as a translator, I feel like I'm recovering those hidden meetings and I'm allowed, I'm free to, to explore that. Uh, but this is maybe allowed in translation in, into Italian if you're doing text from uh, South Korea or Spain even, but when it comes to English, everybody be turns very sensitive. One, because everybody know thinks they know English and they can easily go back to the source. And also that is somehow not respectful because English comes to you as this very, you know, dominant, powerful code. Uh, and so what I started to do is allow myself more and more freedom into this. So I had the chance to work on a beautiful text that was on Earth, where briefly gorgeous by Ocean Wong, which is, of course he's a stylist. He has this beautiful uh, melodic prose, but there's a constant tension because, like me, he was raised by a mother that didn't fully grasp English, and so there's always this uh, language as a failed act in a way. And he was very familiar with this kind of humiliation you grow up with when adults around you are considered not able again to uh, end up a, end a sentence, even bring you know words to their final destination. It's like they're always lost in mid journey. Uh, but I think this idea of being lost in mid journey is something that as a translator, we all know what it means because there is a struggle and it makes it transparent. The fact that sometimes you don't know how to carry the sentence to this full, uh, the, to the end. Uh, and so translating that book in a way I could test all my theories, but in a very instinctive uh, way because it was already there. So it was a happy matching probably between two writers that had this idea that when language gets broken, a lot of possibilities come up. And I wish that in publishing <laughs> there was less this uh, Liz was saying normal before, I would say the verb normalizing, and we are witnessing this because it simply it is a code that is there, and it has this idea that the more 
you are pleasant, the more you can get understood. Actually, I think that that's not necessarily the case. It's when you leave gaps that you leave freedom for the reader to fill in, to be more involved in the process compared to something that is so smooth and so flat and it's just there, like, you know, prepackaged and delivered. This is why I think Liz and I shared a uh, closeness in the idea that not all the gaps should be filled in. Thank you. I, so I mean, I, I couldn't agree more. So, I mean, that's, we've, we've just gone through um, um, responses to wonderful, you know, editing of, of um, the, the translation. And at times those, um, those movements toward normalizing are, are the ones that, that uh, both of us have responded to as we don't want to, this should not be smoothed out. That doesn't mean though, for me that um, uh, I think that um, it, it is a, it, I don't think in terms of power that I don't think of, even though I should, that, that English is this dominant force. I'm not thinking about those things when I translate, um, uh, though I certainly respect those positions. And I, and I don't like that the United States is, is so obnoxiously powerful. I really don't. Um, but I think that that there's there's great beauty in English and that it's actually very flexible um, and that, that we should resist the idea of, of just sticking to, to what's there already. Um, and that, that some of the, the great ways for, um, for American letters, I'm speaking very much in terms of American English, the great way for American letters to, um, uh, to be infused with, with something new is through, is through translation. Um, and that what can happen is that the English can be pushed and pulled in directions, I think, from, uh, you know, from all the languages that are brought into it to, to make it incredibly vibrant. Um, and so this is, this is something that, that I very, very strongly believe in, in paying really close to what, to Claudia's gorgeous Italian and making it equally gorgeous in English, but, but not, I don't want it to just be literally what Claudia, I, that wouldn't work either. If, if I were to just take what she had and put it literally into English, I want it to be spectacular and to resonate off of, that sounds so arrogant of me. My, my hope is that it will be spectacular and resonate off of what, what, what's there in the Italian. Thank you so much. Sure. Uh, I wanted just to ask Marta if we've got a few more minutes, um, Claudia, a little bit about your work translating Ocean Vuong. Um, Martha and I actually both read both books uh, kind of in tandem with each other and in many ways they're quite complementary texts. Uh, we've spoken a little bit about the mother and how the mother functions as a kind of conduit for a lot of this um, code switching and kind of language sharing in different ways. Um, but in, in a lot of ways, it's also a book about communication failure, right? And about the kind of, about the need, and that could be also an emotional need to kind of translate for somebody else or translate your experiences through something, somebody else. And it reminds me of what Liz was just saying now about these kind of hierarchies of power between language as well. And I wondered if you could just speak a little bit to that, Claudia, about this, this sense of that kind of being an inequality in, in voice perhaps in, in that form and how you how you manage that kind of that sense of of, of different layers of narrative right with different kind of power um, relations kind of sewn in. Yeah we are right now in the midst of a strong debate on who gets to translate who uh, but this debate sometimes lacks the idea that the kind of novels or texts that are proposed to translators are different. Some require a uh, distance and some require a philological approach that is more, uh, it stands out more from studying, researching. Uh, I've done translations like that. Uh, the Bond case was uh, an empathic translation and because it was based uh, both on they're both, he, um, on her, um, we're briefly gorgeous, is an open letter to a mother. Mine is a letter in disguise. He uses the format of writing to, to his mom. 
And what really, uh, I think it's fascinating that branches in different ways, if I can uh, uh, discuss the two texts uh, in, in this way, is the fact that his mother is not reading English, which is the language that Wang chooses to write in. And I use Italian because I wanted my mom to understand me. So if you're writing the story of your family, your um, own experiences, you know, being raised uh, um, in, um, in trauma and violence and migration and the United States and you growing up. And if you do that, writing to your mother, but actually knowing that those words wouldn't, you know, go to the full extent to the final destination, how does this idea of concealing affects style? So to me, I think this had a strong impact because even though Wang's uh, language and choice of words is very, uh, it, it, sometimes they're open wounds, I would say, very visceral. Uh, I have a more restrained tone. I have, uh, in a way, my book is always post event. He writes inside the event. Uh, but how would this kind of a revelation, uh, even being uninhibited in the choice of words because he, he knew that the, you know, the person he was addressing wouldn't read it, would clash with his concealing. And so that was something, an idea that really had an impact on how I approached the, the, the translation. And it was also haunting in a way because it was mirroring for me. And when I was working, I was constantly thinking why I was not brave enough to do this, why I was not, I didn't have the audacity, why if we had common experiences and I felt um, there was something lacking in, in La Straniera perhaps, but then I realized that the uh, foundation was profoundly different because to me it was trying to bridge something in between me and my mother and sometimes being uh, restrained or containing information not in order to establish a conversation without an aggression was important uh, because it was how to reach out uh, to, to my mother. And I think this is why it was kind of a haunted uh, and mirrored process of translation, which I think is pretty uh, unique. And also because both uh, works uh, kind of have this, um, he doesn't discuss deafness, of course, but he does discuss deafness in a larger sense, uh, in a political and social sense of society that is tone deaf to the experience of his family. So uh, I do think that even if not um, as a concept in, in On Earth We're Briefly Gorgeous, definitely there's a dimension of silence that surrounds the family. Thank you so much. Thank you, Emma. I mean, uh, uh, the time is running out, so we, we actually plan to read the passage from uh, uh, Ocean Books and uh, Claudia's uh, translation, but I think uh, uh, at this point, uh, perhaps uh, it might be a better idea uh, to gather some questions uh, from the audience instead. Um, so uh, feel free to uh, um, just uh, uh, write uh, your questions in the chat. There is a, fir a first question from Alia uh, that mentioned uh, uh, the need uh, the, uh, that uh, uh, to um, basically uh, have uh, like a, a uh, uh, the presence of someone uh, uh, using sign language to translate this event uh, for the deaf community and the deaf people. And uh, I, I thank you, Alia, for this question, which is really authentic. Uh, uh, and I actually thought about it uh, uh, before, of course, uh, organizing this event, but then unfortunately it was not possible to have this service. And then uh, confronted uh, with the, uh, you know, with the, with this the possibility of not having the event at all or having it nonetheless, uh, maybe I did a mistake, but I personally cho chosen to have it uh, anyway, because I thought it was important. Um, so I don't know whether some of the speakers would like to <laughs> comment uh, on, uh, on this. I actually do. Thanks, Alia. Um, this book has been translated um, into German uh, recently. 
So um, it was published a review on a newspaper, which did something that was very unfortunate. They would take us a quote from my mother that would say, there's no love uh, in between deaf people. There is only physicality or sexuality. And that's the opening of, of an article. It's a huge mess. I was kind of happy of the amount of reaction and conflict and um, by the deaf community that said, how is this sentence applying to the whole of us? So that's something that is very specific to the experience of my mother, which as I tried to explain today, it was always ambivalent in acknowledging her disability and having some, and I think there was a lot of suffering in there, of course, in discarding this experience of disability. So I was raised in this kind of environment, where is not the boundaries in between being deaf or not deaf, accepting sign language, not, it was also another level of strangeness for me and outsiderness in a way, because I didn't hang out with deaf uh, coda, you know, children of deaf adults, I didn't hang out with other, so I was both inside through my mother deafness, but I was also outside because my mother didn't provide me with a language to understand disability. And so I think that was La Straniera about. We had that, that title kind of, uh, I, I asked for it to be removed. Uh, but also I'm having a, a panel discussion with this uh, woman from uh, Julia. I, I cannot remember her last name, but this is gonna happen. And the question is specifically what you're saying. How can you discuss disability if you're not uh, bridging or you're doing that uh, in the place of another? My answer is that this book is about a coming of age into a very specific language and community that is not always acknowledging it. And I think it would have been more helpful even in a way if I had a clear or a streamlined code to understand it. Uh, and so this is the story of what the book is, but I also discuss the fact that La Straniera was, I, I didn't want it for it to be labeled as autobiography or a memoir, even because I was trying to meditate to which extent I could write about my mother's life if I'm not experienced what my mother is going through. So my mother, in a way, says that this is the fake book. She says that the true La Straniera is made by her diaries, her autobiography. So this is the kind of mock uh, memoir. Uh, and of course, there's also an issue of power. Would my mother have access to publishing? Would my mother's diaries, diaries ever be published? Uh, and so I hold on to this. Um, I live and I experience this on a very uh, daily basis in a way. It's, it's funny also how my mother became this literary character in a way that would be appealing in fiction. But if you met her in daily interaction, you would not acknowledge her because she's truly disabled and she's truly deaf. So I went to events, literary events that were absurd because readers were in love with the fictional version of my mother but had this kind of um, hesitancy and even being trying to be removed from her or remove even me from my disabled mother because the fictional version was so much appealing than the reality of disability. So thanks for your question. I don't know if I answered, but I was trying to kind of suggest a lot of issues that are personally for me around this, both as a daughter and both, both as a writer. Thank you. Yes, and then we have a quick question from Armin. Claudia, what is the title of your book in German, please? Uh, Die Fremde, which uh, means it's literally la, la straniera and the stranger, because sometimes they use the Auslanderin, which is the foreigner, but they stick to the, the, the stranger. Thank you. Then we have like from Madalena. Um, I think it's more of a reflection. I read it. This is not the first time that literature or the writer is using their own experience based on living with a deaf person, which made a great, great impact on their life. Andre Asiman wrote about his deaf mother, also in the essay, Are You Listening? Conversations with My Deaf Mother. It would be considered autoethnography or memory studies. And my belief is it should be explored by hearing people in order to explore the deaf culture, just as people tend to explore any other culture. 
Um, don't know. I mean, I think uh, Claudia already touched upon it. If you would like to add anything else. Yeah, I would uh, like to add this episode. I went with this book everywhere in Italy from north to the south. And I went to um, a school in Sicily. And so the teachers asked the girls in class to do a theater, theater representation, like uh, on stage of, of La Straniera. There was a deaf girl in class. And the teachers were kind of, I wouldn't, they were embarrassed because all the hearing girls were participate in translating La Straniera on stage. They wanted my mother's character to be played by the deaf teenager. And she said, no, I have no interest at all. So I go to the school and everybody is kind of, well, we are so sorry that our friend who really knows sign language doesn't want to play and pretend, you know, make believe sign language on stage. And I thought that's what my mother would have done in high school. She couldn't have find anything more boring than being herself on stage and like pushed in the boundary of disability and even representing it and so I thought that was an interesting episode on the way we have expectations of what should be done or not done in representing disability I don't know if this adds anything but I thought it was pretty liberating when I was there and seeing this kind of refusal to accept you know the literality of disability thanks Claudia and we have another question from Sam um, uh, relating to what Elizabeth was saying about Anglocentrism and the obnoxiously powerful US. Uh, he said, I'd love to hear what you think about uh, literary translation becoming a political instrument as it challenges the social pathologizing of issues surrounding language difference and communication difficulties, especially when these are so often used as markers of marginalization. Um. I'm I'm probably not the I'm not the right translator to uh, to to talk about the you know the politics of 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 translation I'm afraid I'm it's just not I I'm I'm much more um, uh, involved in in just working with the book maybe Claudia though who is a translator yeah. has you know has some ideas about about that I just think that if we are going back very briefly on who translates who, translation is often political. It was born as this act of, you know, curiosity and exploring otherness, but often it was about um, having the other surrender to your own language. It was a tool, you know, of imposing your own culture. So it was always uh, ambivalent. And what I like to think about these days is that uh, sometimes I'm afraid when we speak about the act of translation that it was this very poetical abstract thing that happens in a void and it's not mediated through bodies, through histories, through context. So I do think that you can achieve beautiful translation through distance and embodying the other, you know, translation is transition uh, by its own self. But I also think that sometimes translations can be resonant and I would say that the case with Ocean Wrong, I was mentioning, it was a very specific case where my personal experience with gender, with language, with migration, with trauma, with family, my everything that made me the woman I am today fully entered that translation. So I'm not saying that there's a rule, there are cases, there are different novels, you approach novels in a different way and texts in a different way. I don't know how many times in Italy I've been, I don't know Liz if this ever happened to you, but I'm constantly proposed to translate novels on the basis that I am a woman, on the basis that I have some sort of, you know, finesse for being a woman. I never say I'm not going to do that because you're a stereotype, you know, you're using me as a stereotype or labeling me to my identity. I think that in a very playful and ambiguous and ambivalent way, I get the right sometimes to use this womanhood and sometimes it doesn't interfere at all with the process but are we all allowed to do this game of being you know using identity or not using identity so to me it's a lot about access the conversation that is happening right now and so a lot of the things we discussed today really are about who gets to write about what and who translates who and it is inherently related to to access as long we the more we look for 
uh, variated access to the practice of translation, the more it gets fun, I think, because then everybody gets to be ambivalent about identity or not. Thank you, Claudia. I think we, we are uh, reaching the end, but before closing, I would like to ask Emma whether she has any more observations or questions to ask. I just, I think that was such a beautiful uh, line to leave it on, that the variegated access uh, leads to more fun. I think that's, uh, that's something I'd like to take away. <laughs> Thank, thank you so you. much. I just would like to thank uh, immensely Claudia, Liz and Emma for having taken us on uh, this important journey within and outside the borders of otherness and normativity as expressed through literary language. Thank you also to all the members of the audience for their questions and presence. And uh, we look forward to welcoming you again on the 30, uh, 31st of March, translating symbolism into precision medicine. Uh, would be, which will be a discussion and a live performance with poet scientist Vanasce Larigiani and musician Vernon David. So thank you, everyone. Thanks. Well, thank you. Thanks. Bye. 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 Bye.